Welcome to Oasis Online, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name's Dan, I'm one of the leaders here at Oasis and uh, I'm just going to give a brief introduction about what we've got coming up. So we're going to have Laura, who's going to be leading us in worship later, and then we've got Ross, who's going to be sharing the word with us. He's going to be talking to us about the importance of following Jesus' footsteps. And um, happy Father's Day to everyone. I know that Father's Day can be a difficult time for some people, um, but I just wanted to remind us about the truth of our Heavenly Father. So I'm just going to read from uh, the Passion Translation. This is 1 John verse 3. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvellous love that he has lavished on us. He has called us and made us his very own beloved children. So we are selected, we are chosen, we are called by this perfect Heavenly Father. He calls us his children. How great is that? So enjoy the rest of this morning. I'm just going to hand over to Laura now. i 
perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, this love so undeniable, I can hardly. could ever wish for or imagine you are such a good father to us Lord Jesus thank you amen amen good morning everyone and happy father's day we are so pleased that dads you are in our church that we've got such wonderful men of God and there's going to be some uh, men who are not fathers yet but will be one day and we're just so grateful, just want to say to you how much your love today and appreciated. You know, I've been reading the scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, and it says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. And today, I think during this difficult time, wouldn't it be great if we took the opportunity to encourage people today? You know, dads, we want to say we love you and you're fantastic. But there are other people who are out there that really, really need to hear and to know that they're loved today. I want to tell you a story about my dad. This is my dad. This is Arthur Milson Stockwell, my dad, um, who I really loved. When I was younger, I was a little bit afraid of him because he had a bit of a fiery temper. Um, but overall, he was a most loving, gentle man. Well, I want to tell you this story because I think it's important to know it and hopefully you might do something with this story yourselves. So about 30 odd years ago in Oasis, we had this preacher come and he was talking about this scripture about encouraging people. And he was suggesting that we write a letter to someone and to tell them how much they were loved and how much they were appreciated. And I took this talk very seriously and I thought, who, who can I write to? Who could I um, encourage? And into my mind came my dad. Now, my dad was, um, had been a coal miner for 32 years and he, every day he went to the mine, he hated every single day. But he did it out of a devotion and commitment and love to his family. And that's how he made provision for us. And he also, later on in life, did about three jobs to make sure there was adequate provision for his family. So I thought, I'm going to write and tell Dad how much I appreciated every time he went into that cage to go into the mine, the day that every day he hated doing. So I wrote, and as I started to write, I thought of all kinds of things that I could say how much I loved and appreciated him. So then I posted it off to my dad. Now, I spoke to mum and I said, mum, has dad received the letter I sent? And she said, 
oh yes, yes, he's really pleased with it. But you know, my dad never ever mentioned that letter to me, not once. Well then, uh, dad, when he was 84, he was taken poorly and was taken into hospital. And three days later, he went to be with Jesus. And I had to go to the hospital to collect the death certificate and his personal belongings and take them home to my mum. So we were unpacking these things and inside the bag was dad's wallet. And dad's wallet was very precious to him. He always carried it in his breast pocket and it went everywhere with him. So we opened the wallet and in it there was some money. There was a lovely photograph of my mum when she was younger. There was a photograph of my brother David and my sister Faye and me. And then I found the letter. So I realised he'd carried that letter in his breast pocket, in his wallet, for 25 years. And I realised how much those words must have meant to him. Well, we were looking for some clothes. The funeral director had asked us to get some clothes. And so my children, Adam and Elizabeth, said, Mum, we should put the things he had in his wallet in his breast pocket. So we found the photo of my mum. They found the photo of my brother, sister and myself. And then I said, but we've got to add the grandchildren because they were just as important to him. And then um, Adam and Elizabeth said, but mom, don't forget the letter. Put the letter in his breast pocket. So I did. And that was the last time I saw my dad and knowing he had all those things close to his heart in his breast pocket. So that's my story of my dad and obviously how those words meant so much to him. So how much more will your words mean to people you care about? Don't send a text, don't send an email. Get a pen and paper and start to write to someone who you feel prompted by God to write to and tell them how precious they are, how much they're appreciated, how much they're valued. And you'll be surprised at how those words will bring real life and hope and encouragement into someone's life. So do that today. Could be your dad, could be your wife, your husband, your brother, your sister, your friend, whoever. Whoever you feel God prompts you, write that letter today. So bless you. Happy Father's Day. Know you're loved. Speak to you later.
thank you, Father, for your gift of life, your gift of love. There is no greater gift than you, Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believe in him will have eternal life. And that's our story, that's our gift from you, Jesus. And on Father's Day, we want to cherish that, Lord. We want to treasure that gift that you have given to us. To, to pray for Ross and pray for ourselves just before he speaks. So Father, I thank you for the words that you've given Ross, that he's prepared and that he's waited on. And Father, I thank you for the message that he's going to bring to us. And I pray, Father, that we'd be receptive to hear everything that you've got for us in this, Father. As we, as we listen, we want these to be like seeds that are planted in our hearts, Father. And we want to take responsibility for seeing that they are nurtured and they, they grow. Thank you. Amen. So there was a Jewish rabbi and he approached these fishermen and he said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately they got out of the boat and they followed him. Now by follow, we're not talking in the same way as when you're on holiday and you arrive at your hotel destination and the receptionist says, come and follow me to your room. No, this was following the sense of giving up everything. Give up your hometown, your friends, your family. Give up everything to walk in the footsteps of your rabbi. If I was to say to you that a friend or family member of yours had given up everything to follow a religious leader, wouldn't you be concerned? Perhaps you'd be worried that they had just got themselves involved in some kind of cult. And so what's going on here? Why were these fishermen so keen to follow this rabbi? Now, this rabbi's name was Jesus, and these fishermen were to become his disciples. And this moment was to change history as we know it. And yet we still have to ask that very same question. Why did the disciples give up everything to follow Jesus? Now, being a religious leader in the time of Jesus carried with it a certain level of respect and prestige. I'm not sure that's the same uh, in the sense of how a pastor would be seen in today's society. I think if we were to ask the youth here at Oasis what their ambitions and desires are for the future, I'm not sure if pastor would be top on that list. But if we were to have a look at that list, then perhaps we would see professional footballer, YouTuber, content creator, nurse, doctor, lawyer, and yet, if Pastor was on that list, I'm sure we'd all celebrate that fact. And yet, 
This would have been ingrained in young Jewish boys' thought process from a young age. From the age of five, they would have learned to memorize the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And they would continue these studies. And if they got really good and became a great student, then they would hope that one day a rabbi would say those words, come and follow me. And by that, the rabbi was saying that he believed the student had what it took to follow in his footsteps. Oasis is part of Elam Pentecostal churches who, I guess you could say, have a similar process with their minister in training program. And it wasn't long ago that we celebrated alongside Andy and Laura as they were accepted onto that program. Essentially, what Elam was saying is, we think you have what it takes to be ministers here at Elam. But what happens if you don't make the cut? What happens if you uh, aren't the best student? What happens if you aren't the best of the best? Well, Maybe a rabbi will say something politely to you in the sense of, we see God working in your life, but we don't think you have what it takes to follow in our footsteps. So what you need to do is you need to return to your family business, return to your father and go and work for him. Where does Jesus find the disciples? They're fishermen. They're fishermen alongside their father. They haven't made the cut. They aren't the best of the best. They're not the best student. They haven't got what it takes to follow a rabbi. And yet Jesus appears and says to them, come and follow me. And so I hope you begin to understand why the disciples were so keen to step out of the boat and to follow Jesus. I want to look at a passage from Matthew chapter 14. And we're going to be looking from verse 22. Uh, if you've got your Bibles with you, then, then uh, please follow along. If not, we'll, we'll get the words for you on the screen. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, The wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. I find it really interesting how Jesus calls the disciples and their fishermen. And then in this passage, Jesus sends them back into the boat. It's kind of like they're back where it all began. Sometimes in our lives, it feels like we're really close to God and We get a real sense of God's calling on our lives and and then at other times it feels like God is quite distant from us and it feels like we're kind of back where it all began. And so the disciples are facing this storm, they're battling a storm and Jesus has retreated to the mountaintop to pray. I wonder what Jesus would have been praying about. Now there's no doubt in my mind that Jesus was looking to retreat to spend some alone time with his heavenly father. And there's no doubt that Jesus would have been seeking the will of the Father over his life. And I think there's also a lesson for us in that we too should be spending time alone with God, seeking his will on our lives. But I also think that Jesus would have been praying for the disciples. He would have been praying and interceding on their behalf. You see, he had sent them into the storm. And he knew that they were going to be facing the storm. 
And so here are the disciples. They are two to three miles out at sea. And they've been battling this way for a long time. It says that it was the fourth watch. Now, the fourth watch referred to how the Roman military would divide up the nights. And so they would have these four watches. And they would be three hours long each. And this was the fourth. So this would have been between 3 to 6 a.m. in the night. And they would have been battling this storm for nine hours. If you can picture yourself there, you are on the boat and the waves are bashing against the side and you've been there for nine hours. Perhaps you've been praying and calling out to God, praying for him to answer. And if you were one of those disciples, perhaps you'd be wondering, where was Jesus? Had Jesus abandoned them when they needed him the most? Had Jesus abandoned them in the storm? What a year it has been. I kind of miss January, really, when we only really had to worry about World War Three as Iran and America's tensions were building. And who would have known what was to follow with coronavirus and lockdown? For many of us, we've not been able to see our friends and family and um, we've not been able to meet with one another as a church community. It's been a real tough season. And I wonder if any of you have been wondering where God is in this storm. Has God abandoned us this year as we've been facing all these trials and tribulations? Where is God in the storm? If you want to cast your mind back a few weeks when Dan Stanley was um, giving us a message and he was interviewed by Andy and they spoke about how they don't have Netflix. And so I have to make a confession that I do have Netflix. But I want to draw your attention to a documentary series about a great basketball player called Michael Jordan. Now, you may have heard his name before, and this documentary centers on his championship wins with the Chicago Bulls, and it mainly features his final season as he looked to win his sixth championship. But it also goes back and looks at previous years, and halfway through, he'd in fact retired to become a baseball player. And in this time, it was the chance for his right-hand man, a guy called Scotty Pippen, to step up. Now, many will say that people probably wouldn't know Michael Jordan as much as they would without Scottie Pippen. He probably wouldn't have won as much as he did without Scottie Pippen by his side. But without Michael Jordan, this was now Scottie Pippen's chance to show that he was number one. And they nearly won the championship that year. And during one of the big playoff games, with a few seconds to go, they had to hit one more basket to win the match. And the coach called them together for a timeout. This was his moment to show that he was now number one. He'd been in the shadow of Michael Jordan for so long, but now it was his moment. But the coach said, everybody's going to be looking at you. They're all going to be guarding you because they're going to be expecting you to get the ball. So let's give the ball to someone else who's going to be free and they can take the shot and they can win the match. But this was meant to be his moment. And at that time, he decided he was going to sit out. And so they ran the play. They took the shot, they won the match, and he realised his mistake. He'd abandoned his team. This was someone who went on to have a great career, was a great person, but in that moment, he'd abandoned his team. Had Jesus abandoned the disciples when they needed him? Has God abandoned us when we need him the most? And so the disciples think that they see a ghost walking on the waters towards them. You know, they've been battling this storm and they fear the worst, but this was Jesus coming towards them. Isn't it funny how, how many times in scriptures people seem to miss Jesus? They don't see that the miracle is coming. Isn't that true for us? That when we're in the height of the storm, when we are facing the trials and the battles, perhaps we don't see the miracle that is already on its way towards us. And Jesus says, take heart. It is I. In the same way that God spoke to Moses in the burning bush when he said, I am. Jesus says, take heart, it is I. Jesus arrives and points towards his own divinity. Jesus is saying something about himself in this moment. Jesus has arrived in the storm. I wonder what you'd do if you was in that situation. I'm not sure how I'd react. I'm sure... I'd be so pleased to see Jesus having battled that storm for so long to to work out that it is Jesus, to have feared the worst, that it was something that could have been evil. By ghost, perhaps they were referring to something 
demonic. In the storm, they were fearing the worst, and yet the miracle had arrived. Jesus was here. How would you react? I tell you how I wouldn't react. I probably wouldn't ask Jesus to call me to go to him. I probably wouldn't think that I had what it took to walk on the waters towards Jesus. And yet this is exactly what Peter does. Doesn't it come across as strange that Peter thinks that he can walk on the water towards Jesus? Well, perhaps not really. You see, Peter was a good Jewish boy and maybe he hadn't quite made the cut, but Jesus was his rabbi. And so he'd been taught that to be a disciple of Jesus, he needed to become just like Jesus. And so what was Jesus doing? Jesus was walking on the water. And so what did Peter want to do? Peter wanted to walk on the water. And so Peter starts to walk to Jesus and the winds change and he starts to drown. But why is he drowning? Why is he doubting in this situation? Is he doubting Jesus? Is he doubting God? Well, Jesus is still walking on the water. He can't be doubting Jesus. No, it's the winds have changed. The situation has changed. And so he starts to doubt the situation. He starts to doubt himself and begins to drown. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. You see, the situations have changed and we start to doubt what is going on. It's been a tough year for all of us. And I guess as we start to think about our own relationships and our own faith, we start to, to see that in this period of time, as the things have changed, that doesn't mean that God has changed. God is still with us. Jesus is still there on that mountaintop praying for us. In the final stages of that basketball match, as we look to hit the winning shot in the final seconds, has Jesus abandoned his team? No. Jesus arrives in the final seconds and he takes the shot and he hits the basket and he wins the match. The miracle comes in the middle of the storm. When the storms of life come as they will, God is still with us in the storm. The winds have changed and it kind of feels like things are starting to change. The shops are opening again. It's, it feels like things are changing and yet God is still the same through all of this. But I've been really encouraged in this season, really, to, to see what the reaction has been from the church. When we think about some of the things that have gone out from the Blessing UK and how many people were able to engage with that worship. When we read stories about how many people are turning to prayer up and down the country, people are praying more than they ever have done before. People are more open to have conversations uh, about God and we were able to witness on a local level I'm hearing so many stories of people who are getting to know their neighbours like never before we've seen people from within our congregation get out onto the streets to to sing over their neighbours to be a light in the darkness and and so we don't want this time to be a time where Jesus finally does step in and says oh you have literal faith maybe we want to be to have that heart of Peter to say uh, Jesus called us to you. We want to walk on water to you. We want to become more like you in this season. But what does that all mean for us? And as I've been thinking about that, I've been thinking maybe we're in different positions as we listen to this message today. And um, I want you to interact on the comment section below. And so we can kind of support you where you're at and, and help walk on that journey with you. And I've been thinking about maybe three positions that, that you may be in at the moment. For some of you, this storm has been hard and this has hit you hard and it's been painful and you've really struggled. And maybe you have been asking those questions of where is God? Has God abandoned you in that storm? And if that is you, I want you to, to put in the comments below. Lord, I'm reaching out my hand. Restore my faith. Lord, I'm reaching out my hand. Restore my faith. And we have the belief that God will answer that call and, and recognising that we have been facing a crisis. And this has been difficult. This is a difficult time. But Jesus is still there on that mountaintop praying on your behalf. And if you've put that in the comments, then we will follow that up and we we'll continue to walk on that journey with you. And we recognise that it's tough, but we believe that God 
can restore your faith and that God is walking with you in the storm. I also believe for some of us that God is calling us to go deeper. God is calling us to step out of the boat. God is calling us to get out of the boat and to walk on the water to him. Because Peter did that because he wanted to be more like Jesus. And so we seek to become more like Jesus. And if that is you, I want you to put, I'm getting out of the boat in the comments. Right, I'm getting out of the boat. And so we seek to become more like Jesus. We want to walk on the water to Jesus. We want to become more like him. And so what does that mean for us in our lives? What is God calling you to? What are the things that God wants to say to you? And how does he want to use you in this season? Because this is an opportunity for us. This is a big opportunity for us to be a witness and to be a light and a beacon to our communities. And also for some of you watching, maybe you don't know Jesus and maybe you need to to recognise and maybe you, you don't feel worthy. Maybe sometimes you have issues where you doubt yourself and recognise that none of us are the best of the best. You know, the law says that you have to achieve certain things to be able to to follow in the footsteps of your rabbi. And yet Jesus qualified those disciples. Jesus was the one who qualified them. They weren't the best of the best. He was the best of the best. And for all of us, we don't uh, hit the mark. We don't reach what it means to be uh, where Jesus is, is at. But Jesus is the best of the best. And so he's qualifying you this morning. And if that is you and you want to follow Jesus for the first time, then I want you to put in the comments, Jesus, call me to you. Jesus, call me to you. And I believe that if you put that in the comments, that Jesus will honour that and Jesus will answer that prayer. It's a similar prayer that, that I prayed once before where I didn't feel that I was worthy enough to follow Jesus. And also that I challenged Jesus in, uh, if you are real, then, then answer this call. And maybe you can challenge him by saying, call me to you in the same way of that you're challenging God, if you are out there, God, if you are real, then answer that call. And if you've put that, we would love to follow that up and we'd love to pray over that with you. And we honestly believe that if you do pray that, that God will answer that and that you will be able to be a part of this this community of followers of Jesus and that you will be a disciple of Jesus, being able to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And so. I want to close in prayer for us um, as we close. Jesus, we thank you that you are on that mountaintop praying and interceding for us. We thank you that you are with us in the storm and that you are praying and cheering us on. Help us to be closer to you. Help us to become better followers of you. Let us be a light in the world. Let us be a beacon of hope to our communities. Jesus, If anyone is watching who doesn't know you, let them get a sense of your presence and answer their prayers and let them know that they have become a part of a global movement in your holy name. And so let us become better followers of Jesus. Let us continue to walk in his footsteps. Let us get out of the boat and follow where he is.
Let the wind scream, let the thunders roar. So let the waves crash, let the wind scream, let the thunders roar. So let the waves crash, let the wind scream, let the thunders roar. So let the waves crash, let the wind scream, let the thunders roar. Thank you so much for joining us for our online church service. We're so pleased that you've been able to uh, view along with us and we can't wait until we're meeting again, but we're also making the most of this season and we're still church and we're still together. If you are new, then please check out our YouTube uh, channel. You can get all the latest video and worship on there. Please subscribe to that. Uh, Also, if you're not in the WhatsApp group, please let us know. It's been so good to continue to have these conversations at this time and We've also got a Facebook page that we can add you to. And so please get in touch with us uh, and we will get you connected to all of those things. And we want to get to know you more. And so if there's any way that we can support you, please introduce yourselves and let us know. And even if you've been part of the church for a long time, then please interact with us on these channels. It's been so great to get to know each other more. And so let's continue to follow Jesus and become more like him. Let us get out of the boat and to follow where God leads us. God bless you all and have a wonderful week.